This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Well, it's uh, just, I can't tell you how excited I am to be back in Central Florida. I've spent a lot of time here in my Navy and NASA career. And to see this uh, very robust audience interested in commercial space really warms my heart. I've got to say a thanks to uh, Bonnie Dore and uh, Lori Zink for putting on a great uh, uh, itinerary and plan for, for this talk, and uh, certainly my boss, Ken Ford. Um, so at IHMC, I actually work in the new uh, section, which is human performance and resilience, and a lot of what we do is to try to tie in how to get the person, uh, whether it's the, the war fighter or the astronaut or whoever we're uh, uh, charged to take care of and help them do their job in these extreme environments and also to recover in the after effects of it. So one of the things I, I've, I've been doing since I left NASA has been working in the commercial space sector. And so I thought I'd share a few things uh, from that. I work for a number of commercial space companies, uh, Excalibur Almaz and Inspiration Mars, and I, I was the medical director for the two supersonic stratospheric free falls, the Rebel Stratus and the Stratic Space Dive. Uh, that occupied my time for five years from 2009 to 2014. And then I still currently work for a number of commercial space companies as a consultant, including SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, Worldview, which is a stratospheric balloon program, and Highland Prize Trust, which is an educational outreach. Um, one of the things that I implemented when I was involved with uh, as the uh, flight or medical director for the Stratus and Stratex missions was to incorporate students in my uh, uh, training. In fact, I had residents and medical students to complement our staff, and each one of them became a, a, a first author in a number of articles. There's a picture of me just last year out at the um, Spaceport America where the Spaceship Two is being uh, tested. Um, this is a picture of me with Jim Vanderplug, who's the chief medical officer for Virgin Galactic, and that's one of uh, the UTMB uh, residents who's in a Sokol suit, a real suit that's flown in space, getting into a capsule that was flown in space as well. And then a picture just of recently, I do a lot of work in spacesuit uh, evaluations, and uh, these are two students of mine who uh, uh, are, uh, to me, the why I'm still doing this at 65, it's to pass the torch. And many of you here, uh, you know, are in the, in the years that I'm in, which is basically kind of the, the twilight years. And I always like to think about our contribution to uh, the future is to, uh, to teach and to pass uh, those, those uh, uh, lessons on. And I, I love the quote from Krista McAuliffe, which is, I touch the future, I teach. So let's step back to the 60s. Some of you were probably around in that time. Uh, many of you may have actually been involved in this, uh, you know, with our uh, you know, proximity to Kennedy Space Center. Um, and what I love to show is that this is what the 60s were. Government programs heavily funded. You know, 4% of the budget, the uh, uh, GEP went into space uh, research. Uh, the vehicles we used, the Atlas, the Gemini uh, uh, Titan, were intercontinental ballistic missiles that they stuck a capsule and put humans on. Uh, the X-15, which also flew to space, uh, air-launched a uh, rocket ship that took off and got to space a number of times, almost 200 flights in, in, in test phases, and, and uh, several of their pilots actually qualified as astronauts. Fast forward now to the early 2000s, so 50 years later, um, here's what it looks like. Air-launched vehicles, like Spaceship One and Spaceship Two, and uh, in the middle there, the Falcon 9, and the, on the far uh, left, uh, the Blue Origin uh, New Shepard. These are all done by private entrepreneurs in, in uh, commercial companies. Virgin Galactic is flying Spaceship Two now. Um, in the middle there is uh, Elon Musk's uh, Falcon 9 and, and carrying the Dragon capsule and then Blue Origin uh, under Jeff Bezos uh, flying New Shepard. And these are test flights. These are uh, 
uh, flights that are ongoing right now, and this, many of these will be actually, uh, uh, if they haven't already launched from Florida, they soon will be. So why would a normal human being uh, want to go to space? Well, this was a list uh, that came out uh, in 2000 or 2011 on travel dreams. If you had an unlimited budget, what would be the things you could do? And you notice a number of these things are in the hundreds of thousands of dollar range. It's probably more than most of us could afford, at least on, a, on a, uh, an easy budget. And in that list, uh, some of those are actually more expensive than a flight to space, which is about now about a, qu a quarter of a, a million dollars. Now that's you know the price of a house, uh, but the, believe it or not, there's 700 people who've signed up to do that and put deposits down. So it's not without you know, the realm of possibility. Let me ask here, uh, and I'll, I'll ask this at the end too, how many people would, would go to space if they could? <coughs> Excellent. So hopefully there'll be more afterwards than <laughs> and, uh, after me telling some of these stories. Um, any of you done adventure tourism? you know, in some exotic place, some exotic environment. More power to you. I just got back from the Red Sea a, a day ago. <laughs> so we do that because exploring is part of our nature. It's what makes us human and curiosity. And, and, and quite a, honestly, a number of people would love to go to space because it gives you a different perspective. You're closer to the stars. You see the planet. Um, the Earth has got an atmosphere that is essentially very thin. If you had a basketball, it, the atmosphere that we breathe uh, and the atmosphere that we would have to go to to get to space is about four sheets of paper. And, and when you see views from the stratosphere, even from balloon flights, you can actually see layers. And you think, God, it's just that, it's actually not even the, the first layer, it's a barely a, the margin that we have to have to survive. But seeing things and seeing back of the earth gives us a sense of purpose. It's, it, it's one of the things that uh, everybody that's gone to space has felt, I need to take care of our home planet. And the other thing is that there's a huge potential economy there. Just like uh, adventure tourism uh, has done wonders to improve uh, third world countries and also our sense of uh, in, you know, uh, caring for the planet, space will also do that. Now, people have already gone to space in, in the capacity of space tourists. They don't like to be called space tourists, they're called space flight participants. But these uh, folks, one woman and uh, seven guys, or six guys, have gone. One guy went twice. So imagine a two, a th now this is orbital to, to the space station on a Russian Soyuz. Their cost, 25, 30, now 40 million. That's even more. That's, a whole scaled factor up from suborbital, which is in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, Dennis Tito, who I got to work with on Inspiration Mars, went in 2001, really pissed off NASA. Uh, but NASA at the time was not big into commercial stuff, and now they can't embrace it enough. So if you go to Kennedy Space Center, you see the integration with uh, a number of commercial space companies. Most of these folks, except for Guy Liberté, who's a, who's a uh, 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 essentially uh, um, does Cirque du Soleil, everybody else was a technology uh, guru, including Anush Ansari. They all came from high-tech companies, and many of them took their technology up to space with them and did some tests and experiments in the weeks or so, a week that they stayed up there. The first commercial pilots that qualified for astronaut wings uh, in the U.S. Uh, were Brian Binney and Mike Melville, who flew as part of the Ansari X Prize, which required a three people, one pilot and the weight of two crew members, to, to fly to space and do it within a week's time or a couple of weeks' time. And so they actually did that uh, in 2004, flew three times to space. Space, the new definition, uh, is 100 kilometers or 62 miles. In the 60s, the Air Force and NASA definition was 50 miles. But we've decided now that space is 100 miles, I mean 100 kilometers, 328,000 feet. So you can notice that first flight 
in 2004 was just barely enough to qualify at 328,000 feet. Uh, Spaceship One carried one pilot and ballast that was equivalent to two other people in the back. And this is a pretty small uh, vessel, as you can see here. The idea, similar to the B-52 dropping the X-15, was to take a captive carry air-launched vehicle, get out of the upper uh, or the, the lower part of the dense atmosphere, and drop it at 45, 50,000 feet. Uh, that concept has been scaled up now for Virgin Galactic's effort called Spaceship Two. The carrier aircraft is called White Knight Two, and the vehicle that will carry two pilots and six crew or six spaceflight participants uh, is shown here. It's had. Uh, it was first unveiled in 2006 up in New York City, the inside. They started recruiting pilots to fly those in 2011. Prior to this, uh, the vehicle was tested by Scale Composites Corporation and, and uh, the Spaceship Company. They've had uh, two vehicles. Uh, uh, Enterprise was the first vehicle, flew four times, the last time in October of 2014, unfortunately, almost uh, four years to the day, it broke apart during one of the powered flights, and there was a lot of lessons learned there. The new vehicle is called Unity, and it has had three uh, powered flights. But over 700 people have put down money, uh, and the first 100 or so uh, they have, they're the founders. They get to go on parties and have a great time uh, traveling all over the world, waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, unfortunately, the uh, schedule was originally envisioned would have been that they would have flown probably in the mid-2000 time frame, and that obviously hasn't happened. So their uh, cadre of people now has climbed into the, as, as old as the 90s. What's the earliest age you can fly? have to be able to give informed consent, so 18 is the cutoff that the, uh, the FAA Office of Commercial Space Flight says. So you can't fly pregnant and you can't fly if you can't give uh, informed consent as a, an adult. Um, many of these folks have had medical evaluations and an amazing number of people have had medical problems that in part of the preparation to fly, we do tune-ups, basically lifestyle improvements. Here you can see the breakout by age. Um, and we've got several now that are in their, you know, 80 and 90 year old category. And quite honestly, we'd fly them. Blue Origin, which was founded in 2000, uh, has flown out of Texas eight times using the same vehicle. So they've launched, they've launched it. It comes back to Earth, and it, uh, here's the capsule coming down. Beautiful capsule with large windows. And uh, it does propulsive landing, as does SpaceX. What does that mean? It means you save a lot of money because you're not throwing away the launch vehicle every time. And that one's come back eight times and been reused. And they've also done, this is an abort test, right at uh, maximum uh, dynamic pressure. They fired the uh, rocket to separate the capsule, and both the capsule and the uh, um, uh, launch system uh, both landed safely. Where would you go? Let's say we get this rolling in a couple of years. Well, uh, Bob Bigelow out of Vegas, who was a hotel year, uh, invested a quarter of a billion dollars to get inflatable modules, and he has flown those on space station, uh, and they are now part of the International Space Station. Originally, it was just gonna be up there for a short time, but everybody liked the extra space, and so that has been uh, tested. He's also flown scaled down mock-ups, um, uh, he named after his uh, granddaughter, Blair. Um, and his eventual goal is to fly multiple large modules so that somebody could go up there and see the grandeur of space. It's fun to be in microgravity. I've gotten to do it in parabolic flight, but the real joy is to look out and see the beautiful planet. And as you're traveling so many miles an hour, 18,000 miles an hour, you get to see a lot of real estate, and uh, taking pictures is one of the favorite, one of the most favorite things that astronauts like to do. So let's talk a little bit about how do you get there. <laughs> I, I also worked as a consultant for Disney on Mission Space when they had some problems, and 
one of the things was you got to make sure people know that you know it's there's some challenges there. <laughs> one of them is you got to be tall enough to sit in the in the seats. So here you can imagine going to the flying space and having to pass the little height bar like you do in Disneyland, in Disney World. One of the things that's been very uh, uh, good is to have people train in analog environments just like astronauts do. Now the Russians, I gotta say, um, even though they're socialist roots, they are the most, some of the most entrepreneurial people. And so for about $75,000, you can undergo uh, extensive astronaut or cosmonaut training in Russian aircraft. On the, f on the far um, left, uh, you see an Aleutian 76, which is used for parabolic flight. And then below there, they, you see that very large cabin uh, where you get to do uh, training. Uh, and this is, has to require, this is so scary because when you get in the middle there, if you can't reach it, when the gravity comes back on after 20 seconds or so, uh, you can get slammed down pretty hard, so they always have spotters around. You can also fly a MiG-25 to the upper limits of the, uh, the stratosphere, 75, 80,000 feet. And then you can do centrifuge training and also uh, training in their neutral buoyancy to simulate spacewalks. The same thing ha actually can happen in the U.S. There, this is a facility up in uh, North Pennsylvania, Southampton, uh, called the NASTAR, National Aerospace Training and Research Center, and they have centrifuges and altitude chambers. And uh, I've had the opportunity to fly in their centrifuge. All the founders, the hundred uh, first people signing up for Virgin Galactic have gone through, a, a fair percentage of them have gone through the centrifuge training. And what it's like to go to space, lying on your back and getting G-forces, it would be uh, like having an adult sit on your chest and trying to breathe. So you can tolerate it, but it's not easy. It might take three or four minutes of that high G-force, uh, maybe up to seven or eight minutes um, to go through, depending on whether you're going to orbit or just suborbital. Um, this aircraft does parabolic flight and that means that for 25 seconds at the top of the arch, you're weightless and you're floating. And then for 25 seconds, you're at 2G. So the average is 1G, but you're going from 0 to 2G every uh, 25 seconds. A number of uh, models have done it, a number of other folks. Uh, I've gotten to do it oh, uh, countless times in both this aircraft and the NASA uh, KC-135. and. Uh, it flies out of Kennedy Space Center periodically. This is the mate demate facility where the shuttle would get uh, offloaded off of the 747. Um, but it flies routinely out of Sanford in Orlando and at Fort Lauderdale, and then also Vegas and San uh, Jose, California. And just to show you, how could somebody who was totally paralyzed on a ventilator with uh, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease do in microgravity? Well, Stephen Hawking in 2007 actually flew out of Kennedy Space Center and did, he, they were only planning on doing one parabola, so you get one exposure to no gravity. Of course, you know, he's a, a physicist and so Newton's apple was with him in the flight. But he, he ended up doing so well that he flew eight parabolas, which is an amazing amount for somebody who literally can't really do much at all except blink. Um, and that shows you that this is something that anybody could tolerate with enough practice. Now, this is a, uh, any of you Air Force guys recognize this? F-104, real fast rocket. It was uh, also used by the uh, Air Force uh, um, test pilot school out at Edwards, and this was one of those that Chuck Yeager, a uh, kind similar to that, flew. Um, and unfortunately had a mishap in that. But this can go up to the stratosphere in what they call a zoom flight, where you go real, real fast and then you pull up and you can get up to 75,000 feet in that. Um, this is based out of KSC and also uh, can fly in the other spaceport in Florida, uh, Cecil Field in Jacksonville. This just shows you the current uh, number of spaceports that are in uh, either uh, approved by the FAA, and uh, some of these are very active, and some of these are uh, where they do some of the test flights. Uh, uh, 
Blue Origin flies out of uh, McGregor, Texas. Uh, uh, Brownsville is where SpaceX is building a launch facility, and they also fly out of, of mid-central Texas, just the suborbital test flights and uh, engine test stands. But you can see that Florida, having a rich, rich heritage in space launches, is actually leading the pack. And that's in large part to the excellent um, integration between NASA at KSE, the Kennedy Space Center, and the Air Force at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Spaceport Florida, or Spa uh, Space Florida, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is where Cecil Field is, just south of Jacksonville. It's a former Navy base. It was called NAS uh, Cecil Field. And then Cape Canaveral Spaceport, uh, which is affiliated with both K Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. <laughs> Excuse me. This is a great view of uh, Florida at night. And uh, you can see where the heavy population centers are along the coast. But this little dark spot here, that's where Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center are. And the reason that it's so useful is there's not a lot around there. There's actually a wildlife preserve. And so when you launch uh, big, big rockets, they make a lot of noise and people get irritated by that. So um, it's nice to have a lot of free space. The other thing they own is the Eastern Test Range which is controlled by Patrick Air Force Base and the 45th Space Wing, so that any rockets that are launched have controlled airspace. You wouldn't want to be flying an airliner in that airspace, but you do see airliners fly back here, and sometimes they'll get really nice pictures of a launch, uh, but they're flying over land, not over the uh, water. Why do we launch to the east? It's a, it's a you get orbital mechanics that throw the, uh, the spacecraft uh, at a, a certain uh, velocity that's free. So it's, you don't need propulsion to do that. It's free from the Earth. And the lower you are closer to the equator, uh, the more you get. Equator, at the equator, the Earth's moving about 1,000 miles an hour from, you know, in a, in a uh, uh, easterly direction. That's why the sun moves to the west. The sun's still and the Earth is moving uh, to the east. And as a result of that turn of the Earth, it actually throws the spacecraft up into space and you get free energy. Um, this just shows you some of the many facilities that currently exist at Spaceport Florida in the Kennedy Space Center Cape Canaveral Air Force complex. It's a huge number. Uh, processing facilities, launch complexes, uh, checkout facilities, um, processing and hangar space, and uh, also space life sciences stuff. This is the space, floor, the space life sciences uh, building. That's uh, it's actually off, um, off site, so they they can get to it easily. Uh, this is where Blue Origin is building their facility. Traditionally, they've been working on the New Shepard is a suborbital vehicle, but they want to do orbital tests, and so they're building the New Glenn, named after John Glenn. They'll be building that here at the Blue Origin facility uh, as part of Spaceport Florida. Uh, and this is just a view of it from above. These are the two main launch complexes, uh, 46, or excuse me, 36A and B. These were uh, used extensively in the 60s and then have been refurbished now uh, so that they can do launches for um, commercial space companies. When Falcon 9 launches, it actually launches from the Apollo launch complex uh, 39A, which has been repurposed. Uh, this hangar is at the shuttle landing facility, now called the Launch uh, uh, and uh, Landing Facility, or LLF, and uh, that's going to be available uh, for reusable launch vehicles that can, or, uh, say, captive carry. This runway is 15,000 feet and one foot. I think they did that because they wanted to be the longest runway in the world. And uh, I've gotten to land there several times uh, in T-38s uh, and uh, the Gulfstream II that NASA flies. Uh, there's a lot of uh, drainage ditches around there that have alligators, so there's an incentive to stay on the runway. <laughs> uh, the runway is 200 feet wide, so it's a little wider than your conventional runways. And the Zero-G Corp B, uh, the Boeing uh, 727, has flown out of here uh, on special occasions. For the most part, it flies out of Sanford and F Fort Lauderdale. 
This is a rendition of what the plan is to enhance the hangar space on the shuttle landing facility. And here you see a large aircraft. This is the strata launch uh, that was uh, started by Paul Allen. Uh, six engines, it's a monster big thing, just completed an air taxi test. So we do air launch because you get out of the lower atmosphere and you save a, 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 you save a first stage, essentially, so you can carry a, a larger payload to orbit. And this one is flown, this is the uh, orbital ATK uh, L1011 that has an air, air launched uh, uh, system called Pegasus. This is, a this is a picture of the strata launch, which has done high-speed taxi tests out at Mojave up to 90 miles an hour. And then uh, this is the Virgin, Galac or Virgin Orbit. Uh, you know, is he, basically, uh, Richard Branson, in a brilliant move, took a 747 that was part of Virgin Atlantic and just repurposed it to carry a large air-launched rocket called Launcher 1. So all these things are capable of flying out of Kennedy Space Center. In fact, Pegasus was supposed to launch a satellite uh, this October, but it ended up uh, getting delayed. And it's launched multiple times out of there off the skid strip, which is a short field, uh, shorter free, uh, runway than the shuttle landing facility. Um, Blue Origin, or excuse me, SpaceX has been launching routinely out of, uh, out of uh, KSC on Launch Complex 39A, and this is their Launch Control Center at, at the Cape. Um, now, many of you probably follow this on the news, but uh, they've been able to land uh, their uh, first stage back on, a, on a, a barge. And a couple of times they didn't do it successfully because the thing was rocking and rolling. But any of you carrier guys, you know, can you imagine an autonomous landing of a rocket on a barge? Coming back from space, that's amazing. And it's, it's done it multiple times. In fact, this is a time-lapse photo of a launch. This is the launch at a 39A and then the propulsive landing back on land. So not only can they land it on the ship out in the sea that nobody's on, it's just an autonomous drone ship, but they can land back on land. And th this was, uh, tw 2017 was the first time they actually took one that had been fired before, re refurbished it, and flew it again. Uh, and they're hoping to cut the cost, launch costs, uh, extensively. Any of you in Florida got to see this thing go? The BFR, the big Falcon rocket, uh, or Falcon Heavy, which is basically a Falcon 9 uh, with two strap-on Falcon 9 boosters. And the, I, I don't have the video of it, but I have the landing, just a photo of it. The, these two booster uh, propulsion modules came back and landed almost simultaneously, and it was like, holy cow, that's impressive. They didn't recover the middle section because they'd had to come back on a landing ship, and they just didn't have the manpower to cover it, but this was the payload. In a true Elon Musk fashion, he took a Tesla, and this is a spacesuit. I actually got to be, I was involved in the first human test in a vacuum chamber with that as a, as a mo medical monitor. So he stuck this thing in there, and then he launched it, and, and then he had a selfie taken, and can you believe that? I mean, that, most people thought, that's got to be fake. It looks too clear. And he had a little s a camera on a, on a wing out there to take these pictures, and you could watch the video real time as this thing's traveling through space. I mean, this is science fiction turning into science fact. It's awesome. And somewhere, you know, millions of years from now, somebody's going to find this thing and think, what? <laughs> wonder if it'll still run. And not to belittle uh, the other effort that's done in Florida, which is Cecil Field, is, uh, Cecil Spaceport has got a very active program, and this is one of the renderings of their uh, launch support facility and their tower and launch control center. Um, so hopefully they'll be up and running. Uh, this is one of the uh, tenants out at, uh, at Cecil uh, Field Spaceport, which is an air launch system similar to Pegasus. So the other one that's kind of emerging, and this is something that came out of the stratospheric balloon programs I was involved with, with the Red Bull Stratus and the Stratic Space Dive, is, hey, why, why, why spend all that effort using a rocket um, when we can go in a balloon and we can drink going and coming? <laughs> Which, if you any of you done balloon flights? You know, you get the champagne and everything, and they make the 
they'd take the cork and the, uh, the wrapper and make a little balloon out of it. And it's like, man, this is a great idea. So this is also something that is actively being done now. Uh, one group's in Barcelona and the other group's out in Tucson. And uh, I work as a consultant for Worldview, which is the one that this one was modeled after. This was a couple of years ago. Um, now, there are several reasons to go to space. One is the view, which I actually think is more important than flying around in microgravity. Think about these guys that are going to do a five minutes in microgravity in a suborbital flight. You're going to get a little time in the window. That's the, that's the thing. Well, as it turns out, the curvature of the Earth at 100 kilometers, which is the definition of space, is not very different than 40 kilometers, which is where stratospheric balloons can fly. So you can spend a lot of time going up, being at altitude, drinking, not that I'm a proponent of that, <laughs> but it's not a bad thought, <laughs> and eating. You can take grandma up, because she's not going to be, she could be in a wheelchair, because you don't have launch loads. So virtually anybody can do that. And so these companies that are involved in this have got a real gig, and it's a lot cheaper. Uh, and the view from the curvature of the Earth standpoint is about the same. This is zero to infinity. They're doing scaled down model tests uh, with balloon launches. And this is a view of theirs in the stratosphere. They've also carried payloads that are paying customers and launching uh, uh, essentially what's called a rocketoon, where you have a rocket launched off a balloon, which was actually done in the 60s. Um, I, and <laughs> believe it or not, they actually even detonated a nuclear weapon that way uh, from a balloon. Uh, and then this is a, what the Worldview is going to be is doing out in Spaceport Tucson, which is a beautiful facility. They carry a parafoil up, and the parafoil brings the uh, capsule down, which can take six, eight people uh, pretty easily. They've also deployed a parafoil at 100,000 feet, which we never thought was possible. And they're doing a number of, this is a view over Glen Canyon Dam near Page, uh, Arizona. Uh, now that's a scaled down model too. That's I think a one sixth scale model. And that's just another view of the, of the kind of curvature of the earth and the beautiful topography that you see. And then finally, uh, just to, to kind of wrap things up is the future is, wow. Wouldn't it be nice to cut down travel time across the globe? And that's where the next phase, which is being looked at, is called suborbital point to point. So Richard Branson's not just interested in going up and taking tourists, uh, spaceflight participants, to do a, 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 a parabolic or a, a parabolic five-minute exposure. Get up there, skip across the atmosphere, and land somewhere. And if you can get, say, a, um, a London to Sydney flight, which is about the opposite end of the world, in 70, 80 minutes. And London to New York is 30 minutes. So these are game changers. And these are, this is the uh, Skylon Reaction uh, Limited engine design that's act actively being tested out in Britain. So we'll wrap things up here. I would submit that space tourism is our next big phase in, sp in space flight. We're, um, we've flown 560 people in this, from the 60s to the present, and that's you know, over uh, 60 years, so maybe two a year. When we start flying six, eight a day, in each vehicle, and there will be multiple flights going up there, we're going to get a lot more experience. And people that fly in com the commercial sector will be people who have medical issues. And we're going to learn a lot about, about that, because they're much more uh, open to sharing information. So there will be a huge amount of lessons that will learn. But the most, to me, the most important thing is that it will inspire people to you know, really say, hey, we need to take care of the planet. Um, so from a research standpoint, which is something we're actively involved with at IHMC, monitoring systems that can collect all this kind of personal information, integrate it across different platforms, and then have something that they could go home and share with their families, and also researchers could access that, will be a, a, a huge boon to mankind and humankind. And then downstream, suborbital point-to-point cutting times from literally 12 16, 18 hours down to an hour and a half at most is a huge game changer. 
So with that, I'll give you uh, my contact info. Uh, I, I don't know how long I have to, sh to share questions or throw the box around. Uh, I, oh, wait. How many people want to go to space now? Is it more? Yeah. All right. So it worked. OK, so how do, we, how do I pick the, I saw her hand up first. So. OK, her hand up. You, Are you ready? So Lori, I'm told, is a really good basketball player. Will you talk? So you put, put, put it down in front of you right here. Just run and talk. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Raise it up just a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yeah. OK. You talked about our atmosphere being four pieces of paper thick. But what is in space? Is what, what kind of an atmosphere, or is it a vacuum, or what is it up there? Well, I mean, I'm not an atmospheric scientist. I just you know, have had to deal with the consequences. Good shot. So um, at 100,000 feet, it's about 1% of the atmosphere uh, on, at sea level. That's a, actually 1% is what Mars atmosphere is like. So when we want to test reentry systems for Mars, we shoot something up either by balloon or a rocket to 100,000 feet or higher in that range and test that because that's very similar to the Martian atmosphere. Um, if you go up higher than that, there's still particles, but they're, I, I can't remember the, the, the distance, but it might be, you know, you know, like a couple of particles in a, in, in a square meter versus, you know, a huge number down lower. And it's just nothing? Well, um, when you get, so what happens to uh, particles in space is they eventually uh, change their state. So. Uh, if you take water, at 63,000 feet, it goes from a liquid to a gas. So it, it, you know, it, it's, it, there's less atmospheric pressure, so th physical properties change. At about 115,000 feet, the, it's the triple point of water. Any physics guys here, or physics people? The triple point of water, it's where all three states exist simultaneously. It freezes, it's a gas and a solid and a liquid all at the same point. Um, so water um, changes extensively. The oxygen molecules, which make up about 20, 21 and a half, 20 percent uh, of the uh, con content of the Earth's atmosphere, they're just spread out farther because the, the, the pressure is less. Um, and essentially, the atmosphere from an aerodynamic standpoint ends at what they call the von Karman line which used to be thought about 400,000 feet at the top of the four sheets of paper. So be below that, you can have some aerodynamic control if you go really fast. Above that, there's not even enough molecules of anything to give you aerodynamic control. But really, that line is probably lower, the aerodynamic control line. But so out in space, it's, there might be debris, things that travel extremely fast. but. Well, there's a Tesla out there somewhere. Uh, now, what if, you know, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are always going head to head, and I could just see Bezos going, let's go get that thing and bring it back and burn it off. <laughs> Competition is good. Hold on, everybody. We have first question here. I think there's one in the back, and you were here. Sorry, I, we're not going. I, and I, I've got. <laughs> testing, testing. Oh. Um, what kind of opportunities would there be for a senior pre-med student at the University of Florida who aspires to go to medical or PA school to specialize in space medicine? Would that be a good career, and what should they do? Well, I'm, a, I'm an accidental space medicine guy. I started out in marine biology and diving and, you know, ended up going to the Navy and flying. And so I would say it's excellent. So it, I, I teach at Baylor College of Medicine, and we have a medical student space medicine track. If you're interested in space, uh, get my business card, and I will send you more stuff than you could possibly imagine. I have a lot of books electronically um, and articles from different. So whatever question you have, I probably I won't have the answer, but I can send you stuff that would give you the answer. So here, I'll leave some of my cards around. I wouldn't want to be picking the uh, 
this, the question or. How do you, hello? You're talking in the right place? Hello? I'll repeat, I'll, I'll repeat the question. I may be not needed. <laughs> what do you see the relationship between government funding for space and private funding for space? Excellent question. What is, how does government and private funding interact? <coughs> Any of you guys were around during Apollo? We got to the moon because of a triumvirate between academia, government, and industry. We could not have gotten to the moon without all three. And I am absolutely convinced that that exists today. It used to be, oh, you know, we're government, no, no, no. Nah, we gotta go back to that model, the Apollo model. Academia, industry, and government have to work together. And they are now, because Kennedy Space Center is an is a, is a, a absolute example of that. We, we can't do it, all. Each, of, each group has advantages and disadvantages, and to, but together, and it shows the power of collaboration that any, we can do anything together. Um, so that will be the, the way of the future. SpaceX, Blue Origin, all these companies, are, they want to do government contracts, but they want to do their own thing. And they're putting huge pressure on the government to say, hey, we can do things unbelievably cheaper. Um, SpaceX's ability to launch for prices that are a quarter of what other competitors are being able to do is a total game changer. Why? Propulsive landing, recycling. He's, uh, Elon Musk has got so many reusable boosters that he come back down, he doesn't know what to do with them all. So um, <laughs> there are some game-changing technologies that are out there, and this is just one part of it. Propulsion is a, is a part of it, communications, micro-miniaturization. All that. I hope that answered. It's working now. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, you, you didn't really talk about this tonight, but uh, what can you tell us about space tourism to Mars, and when do you think uh, there will be space tourists on Mars? Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos both, who are um, Private individuals who've created companies that are driven to that, are, they're, they're actively pursuing that. Propulsive landing actually saves money on Earth, but it's absolutely required to land on Mars. You can land smaller things with a parachute and an airbag, but for big things like habitats and supplies uh, that you would need, you need a propulsive landing. So that technology is very applicable to recycling on Earth, but it's really essential to doing uh, large uh, payload landings on Mars. Well, you know, Elon Musk, uh, I think about maybe a couple weeks ago, had he'd been working on this and it had been in the background for quite a while, but he's got a Japanese uh, entrepreneur who's put down over a hundred million dollars to fly artists on a lunar flyby mission like Apollo 8. So they don't have the complexity of landing on the moon, but you go out, it's a quarter of a million miles to get out there, or, orbit around for X number of orbits, you get inspired, come back, and I can hardly wait to see what they do. That's now, they're planning on doing that maybe 2023. They can do it with a BFR, the Big Falcon rocket, and, uh, and a, a, a pretty nice uh, capsule because any of you gone camping in an RV with a family and imagine where you couldn't get out for a couple week, a week? I tell you, there, you know. There's been some really interesting stories in space already about fist fights and things like that. The Inspiration Mars mission I was involved with, we were gonna send a married couple because that was the only way it was gonna work, you know. It might not work, but it's a lot better chance if you can share the toilets together. You know. Sorry. Okay. Oh, I have to talk. Oh, okay. Hello. Hi. I, have a, I hope you can answer this question. What physiological changes occur in the human body once you're up in space? Okay, so uh, that, the question about physiologic changes to the human body. Um, you, know, you know what's interesting? We are a very adaptive species. And we uh, have settled different areas. If you think about, you know, you have people that are living, you know, continuously in the mid-teens. Uh, you know, there's consequences to that. 
uh, cold temperatures, uh, even undersea habitats. So we are an adaptive species. The one constant that we've, we, we've ad adjusted to different altitudes and we've adjusted to different temperatures and different environmental constraints, but one thing we've always had is gravity. So the, the absence of gravity for sure would be drastically affect reproductive uh, processes in embryologic development, and that's been shown in, in animal models where there are huge distortions of their spinal column, et cetera, et cetera. But humans have lived in space, Peggy Whitson, 665 days, and she's our, she's our record holder, and we've got a couple that have cumulative, cumulatively done, you know, seven, 800 days, mostly in the, in the Russian side. So we know that people can survive in microgravity and low Earth orbit, where there's a little bit higher radiation, maybe 10 times higher radiation than we would get on, on Earth. Microgravity is like bed rest. It's bad for you. Any of you here take home anything, it's don't quit moving. Moving is essential. So one of the things that happens in space is you get disuse, shrinkage of muscles, and you lose bone density. On Earth, after puberty, we start to lose bone density at about 1% per, per year. And that goes on and on until at some point we start to have bones that really are soft. In space, in microgravity, it's 1% per month. So it's a 10 to 12 uh, fold increase in the uh, bone density uh, 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 decreasing or diminishing. Now, with resistive exercise, we can stop that. So the take home point is that even in the absence of gravity, you've got to load your muscles and load your bones to keep those bone and muscle forces uh, active. And, 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 the, and also, cardio, you, you lose uh, your heart function, your aerobic capacity. So the key thing is a lot of the degenerative effects that we see from the absence of gravity can be countered by activity, even on uh, you know, in space where all you have is resistive exercise and a cycle ergometer and some other things. And the take home point for all of us here is don't quit moving. Stand up at, you know, I have a desk now that I, they, you know, they're too cheap to buy a, a seat so that I have to stand up and type. And you know, I stand up a whole day and it's great. So all of us can, can uh, you know, keep that 1% per year decline going by getting out and getting off our our, our butts. John, we have one right here. Oh, and if sorry. you have other questions, I'll have my contact info. You can send me stuff and I'll send you more stuff. Yeah. Yes, I, I worked on the Apollo Mercury projects back in the 60s, but that's not really my question. Um, well, my about, hat's off to you. Well, <laughs> it was uh, what I had to do was it's so semi interesting. It was solar flares and. Oh, things. wow. Yeah, that's a big deal. But my question is about the Tesla. Um, when he sent it up, didn't they play, a, I forgot rock. what the rock song was. Oh yeah, it's, uh, it was uh, David Bowie's. Uh, right, right. Uh, Who can hear it in space? <laughs> and why did they do that if you can't hear music in space? I, well, I, they must be doing it by radio transmission because we don't hear in space right. because there's no atmosphere to transmit audible sound. In fact, in the, in, the, uh, you know, in the programs you talked about, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, the Kamen atmosphere was five PSI, which is a third of an atmosphere, and sounds sound differently in less pressure. Um, but in the absence of any molecules to resonate, you won't hear. So, good, you know, good question. You, you can't hear in space unless you transmit it electromagnetically. I wanted to ask what um, prepara psychological preparation space travelers undergo before they go into space and what debrief psychological debriefing they go after they return from space. Um, oh, I, I have the book out in there. There's a, a book that's on, called the Space Tourist Handbook and they talk about you know, a lot of the kinds of things. So, actually, psychological preparation is huge. It's huge. The vehicles that you go in are very small, okay? So the Spaceship Two would be like a, 
a, a roomy SUV, um, and you're up there for a couple hours to get up to altitude and then you know, launch, and the whole thing may take a couple of hours. But if you're claustrophobic, or you don't like the person's body odor, I mean, it, it can be a factor. And there have been fights in space. I, I, I do a talk on, in fact, I have a YouTube channel, and you could listen to some of the videos on there about how uh, two crew members up in space for months at a time were at the point where they were, wanted to kill each other. So getting, you know, there are people that you can be habitable with and not habitable with. In college, you're, you know, when you had to share a room with somebody, it, the, the psychological component actually is a huge, huge, huge big deal. Um, so how do you prepare for it? Great question. What they do now, at least for the founders, is they train together and they bond. So there's things about doing things together and learning the quirks of a personality um, that are really, really important, and learning respect uh, and tolerance. You know, you can learn to tolerate things. And also, hey, if you're an a-hole, maybe quit being an a-hole, you know? Uh, well, you know, it's that or face the gallows, you know? Anybody else want the box? Why are you up there being an a-hole? What's the biggest problem they have when they come back adjusting? Boy, that's a great question. What's the problem you have coming back? You know, so I took care of a lot of the astronauts, and one of them was a close friend of mine who, you know, had a bad thing happen after her flight, and, you know, you, got, you guys may remember that, Lisa Nowak. Sometimes what happens after you've had this intense high that you've seen something unbelievable is, it's hard to come back and be just a normal person. And um, that's something I've seen in other astronauts, too. There's been post-flight, I, I know a colleague of mine, he was a Navy flight surgeon astronaut, killed himself. Uh, there was an, uh, a, a, a French astronaut who tried to commit suicide. So there's some, some psychological things that can happen. And so part of what, and it's part of what we study in IHMC and resilience is you've got to learn to deal with the things and the highs and lows can be a real challenge. So you come back from space, you had this tremendous high, it's just like an incredible adrenaline rush. And then this thing is voided when you're back down and all the you know, the um, hoopla and, and excitement and, and all, and it's now, now what? How do I be a normal person? So people that have done incredibly, uh, you know, challenging things or dangerous things, they get through it and then they have, to, they have to deal with that. And that is something that I think we all need to have close family and friendship support, a deep introspection and grow, turn you know, turn things that are hard and challenged into uh, uh, something that makes you grow. And I, I kind of look at it like this thing we see a lot in the military is post-traumatic stress, but really what it should be is post-traumatic growth. Because you think about our ancestors and what they endured. Holy cow. I mean, it was incredible. You know, how, whatever, you, you go back and know your heritage and you think about what our ancestors went through and we go, Man, I mean, I'm pissed off because I'm stuck in traffic? <laughs> Get over it. You know where I learned that from? I took care of a lot of POWs from Vietnam. And those guys are the most, you know, I mean, for all they've endured, they have this incredible sense of, I'm alive today. Embrace it. So those are the kind of things that all of us can look back and say, how do I become a better person as I get older and my bones hurt and, you know, my friends are dying off and things like that. You have to have that resilience and cherish every moment, every second of the life. Okay, um, I'll come to you next, and you right now. Ready? <laughs> I just have two questions quickly. Like uh, the age group, there was one there that was 80 plus. Those people pass the uh, examination. And the second one, what about, you mentioned something about competition, which is always good. But what about international competition? Like, what are the Russians doing? Um, well, I mean, we learn a lot. Actually, this International Space Station, and I grew up as a military officer in the Cold War, and I was in combat, and, 
And I tell you, what, what I've learned is that what's really, really important is diversity. And having, you know, not homogeneity is having diversity because everybody brings to the table a different experience. If for nothing else that you can tell stories about, you, you know, what you've done and what your, you know, forefathers and foreparents did and, t and have that kind of thing. So we had this, there's an active discussion about, you know, mixed gender crews. The U.S. and all the, you know, European and uh, uh, Japanese, everybody's like, we're going to have mixed gender crew. The Russians have had some problems in their chamber tests when they had women on board and the guys got a little rowdy. And so they go, well, we're just not going to fly women. And they, so they have a kind of different attitude about certain things. And um, from all the things that I've seen, in all my life experiences, diversity, diversity, diversity. And I, I grew up in the military where women didn't, weren't allowed to do stuff, and now they are. And it's made, it made you know, some of the crazy, absolutely insane things we did in combat, they wouldn't allow that. And so it's like we're, we're more humane in, in many ways. So from my perspective, we need to have that uh, diversity in, in our, uh, you know, in our, approach to it, particularly for long duration missions of many months or even years in transit, because otherwise, it, you know, they'll end up killing each other. Okay, this will be our last question. Is there a practical way currently to protect against solar and galactic radiation beyond Earth's magnetosphere? <laughs> well, <laughs> next. <laughs> so. The three main challenges we have in spaceflight, particularly long duration spaceflight beyond low Earth orbit, deep space, are radiation, microgravity deconditioning effects, and um, behavioral health effects. And the one that is the gift that keeps on giving is radiation. Um, I don't know if I have a, 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 an answer for it other than that there are things that are actively being looked at. One is that there's two kinds of, or well, uh, two general kinds. The solar particle events come off as a, you know, a, a coronal mass ejection. It's what causes the, you know, the beautiful array of light in the northern and southern hemispheres when it gets into the Van Allen belts, and that can cause a very large spike in potentially acute radiation uh, exposure. The other one is galactic cosmic radiation, and those are, those are ones that we are, you know, are, are less pre pre predictable, and they, are, they will have long-term health consequences, maybe not short-term consequences. I, there's a huge radiation research program at NASA and other space agencies to try to get a handle on it. Ideas like um, pharmaceutical countermeasures to radiation, uh, we know that the electromagnetic fields around the Earth, the Van Allen belts, protect us a, 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 by a fairly substantial amount. So there's ideas about generating uh, an electromagnetic field around a vehicle. Um, interesting research on uh, animals that are used as the main models is that if you get little exposures, you build an adaptiveness to it. It's kind of like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to trivialize it, but it's kind of like going out and getting a little sun before you're going on a long trip where you're going to be out on, the, be out on the beach, getting prepared, essentially. And there also, it's sad to say, that there's probably gen, uh, gen, genetic predispositions to the various kinds of damage that the body can incur. And so there's a large program now looking at the omics, the precision medicine component, that says you have this propensity or this um, susceptibility or vulnerability. And a big driver for precision medicine in the space program is the radiation concerns. And I've got a ton of material on it. If you want more, I can give it to you. I would look at it as, you know, we have to have practical solutions. Carrying more lead, not probably going to be helpful. Water and polypropylene seem to be pretty good shields. Um, but there's also deep, you know, the uh, heavy iron, heavy uh, 
particles that can actually cause ricochets and secondary particle events. And so by putting a, a shield there, it may just create a different kind of effect. Um, any of you that are interested in that, let me know. I can send you material on it. And by the way, get your kids to go study that because that might be one of the big challenges of the three that we are going to face in deep space exploration. And by the way, it's not just uh, humans that are affected by it. Electronics are too. If you look at, I know you want me to get out of here, but um, <laughs> in space, the astronauts, when, they have, when they're sleeping, they will see heavy, ion, heavy particle events hitting their retina. And they're called uh, light flashes or retinal flashes. And there's a little hole in the uh, uh, protective uh, belts called the South Atlantic Anomaly. And they'll see more of those light flashes in the South Atlantic Anomaly. And also at the, at the poles, the, 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 the Van Allen belts curve inward, so there's less protection at the polar regions. So at the high latitudes, north and south, and in the, in the South Atlantic Anomaly, they'll see lightning flash. They'll see the retinal flashes in their eyes much, to a much greater extent. That's the same exact area, the same exact area where single event upsets to microcircuit electronics occurs. So we need to do this not just for the human, but for the, if we even send unmanned vehicles out there, our uh, electronic components are also very vulnerable um, as well. So great questions. Wow. Jonathan, thank you so much. Please thank Jonathan.